Welcome to, to our talk about compassion event with Dr. James Dotti. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to remind our audience that due to time constraints, uh, there will be there will not be a QA session at the end of the event. Uh, today is our lucky day. I am thrilled to have with us an excellent neurosurgeon but also, and more importantly, a remarkable human being. You must know, Jean, that I am the honorary president of your fan club. <laughs> That's very sweet. <laughs> I deeply admire you, and I love your beautiful family. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. It's really a joy. I wish I spoke Spanish, but alas, I do not. But uh, it's wonderful to visit you in Mexico and uh, uh, speak. Next time you will be, you know, you, you, you will join us uh, speaking in Spanish. I know that you can do it. <laughs> well, muy poquito. <laughs> Beautiful accent. Well, let me introduce properly Dr. And Dr. Dotti, uh, James R. Dotti is a clinical professor in the Department of uh, Neurosurgery at the Stanford University and the director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism for Research and Education at the Stanford University School of Medicine. As director of CQR, Dr. Dotti has collaborated on a number of research projects focused on compassion and altruism, including the use of neuroeconomic models to assess altruism. Through the CCAR, he has developed compassion cultivation training in individuals and, it, and its effects. Assessment of compassionate and altruist, judgment utilizing implanting brain electrodes, and the use of optogenetic techniques to assess nurturing pathways in rodents. Presently, uh, he is developing collaborative research projects to assess the effect of compassion training on immunology uh, and other physiologic uh, determinants of health, the use of mentoring as a method of instilling compassion in students, and the use of compassion training to decrease pain. Dr. Dotti is also an inventor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, having given support to a number of charitable organizations, including children as the peacema Peacemakers, Global Healing, the Pachamama Alliance, and Family and Children's Services of Silicon Valley. He's on the board of directors of a number of non-profit foundations, including the Dalai Lama Foundation of which he is chairman, and the Charter for Compassion International, of which he is vice chair. He is also on the International Advisory Board of the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions. He also writes for the Huffington Post. Today, I consider it important to bring Jean Dante in because uh, we live in times where conflicts and anxiety have grown. Hence, we need more tools to protect ourselves and others. Compassion is a powerful tool. When I change the way I see myself, I change the way I see others. And this results in a very positive transformation. It results in us being genuine. It is not easy, but it is important to cultivate compassion because it has positive impact beyond that obvious. That is, more effective tools are created such as accepting and forgiving without waiting or demanding that the others change, and conditional acceptance and love. Let's speak about how Jindoti came to be. 
uh, your book, Jean, by the way, I have your book over here with your beautiful letter over here. <laughs> <laughs> your book, Jean, Into the Magic Shop, translated into 31 languages, has changed the, li the lives of many people, and that is something wonderful. Thank you for that. How would you describe your your childhood? Uh, what happened in the in the magic job? Well, I um, grew up in a difficult childhood. Um, my father was an alcoholic, and my mother had had a stroke when I was a child and was partially paralyzed, and had a seizure disorder, and unfortunately uh, was chronically depressed, and in fact um, attempted suicide multiple times. The um, we were on essentially public assistance uh, all of my childhood, and neither of my parents had gone to college. And as you probably know, uh, there's something called adverse childhood experiences. And when children grow up in poverty, uh, in which there's a, a parent who has drug or alcohol uh, challenges, or where there's mental illness or violence, uh, the likelihood of that child um, growing up to succeed by traditional measures is very low. And in fact, there's a very high incidence of essentially repeating the same trauma that they lived through. Uh, oftentimes, children from these environments um, become alcohol or drug abusers. Oftentimes, they have mental illness, depression. And it's a, it's a very unfortunate uh, situation. At the age of 12, uh, I was angry, uh, filled with despair, had a sense of hopelessness, and that I had no future because I did not have access uh, to mentors. I didn't have uh, funds to think about paying for college. Uh, and so uh, I was also angry just because of having to be in that situation and had uh, a fair amount of hostility towards my parents. Um, and what happened, though, is that when I would get upset and angry about the situation, I would leave my house and I would get on my orange Stingray bicycle and pedal as fast as I could to be away from it. And on one of these bicycle uh, rides, I went by a place where I don't go very often. And uh, in this mall, there was a magic shop, which I walked into. And what I tell people is walking into that magic shop really changed the trajectory of my life. Because when I entered, there was a woman sitting there. And as it turned out, she was the owner's mother, and she knew nothing about magic in its traditional sense, but she knew a lot about people and human nature. And she greeted me with this radiant smile that actually embraced me and made me feel very comfortable. And we use now the term psychological safety. Uh, she also treated me with respect, uh, with dignity, and talked to me like. I was her equal. And all of those things combined made me feel very comfortable with her. And after a few minutes of talking, uh, probably about 20 or 30, she said, I'm here for another six weeks. And she said, I think I can teach you something that could change your life. And I wish I could tell you I was smart enough uh, to uh, um, know what she meant exactly or know how it would change my life but the reason i showed up every day was because she gave me cookies and frankly i had absolutely nothing else to do so i did show up every day uh, for six weeks and you have to remember this was before terms like mindfulness or neuroplasticity were used at all and clearly this woman had had experience with eastern religions and knew about meditation. And uh, from that point, then I showed up each day and uh, she taught me a lot, which I can tell you about if you'd like. Yes, of course. Uh, 
precisely let's talk about meditation and compassion and how your connection to training the mind was started in this dialogue with Ruth in the shop. Uh, what she was teaching you in some ways uh, was a standard meditation practices, but in other ways it wasn't. Uh, how would you summarize, Jean, uh, what she taught you? Well, I think uh, traditional mindfulness uh, does not have a component of self-compassion, and in fact, it typically doesn't even mention compassion. Uh, traditional mindfulness is taught as a uh, breathing exercise combined with a relaxation technique that shifts you from your uh, sympathetic nervous system or that part of your nervous system associated with the flight, fight, or freeze response to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is what we call the rest and digest system. And um, the other thing is once you get into this meditative state, the dialogue that you have going on in your head, the negative dialogue or the negative uh, emotional states, you, you ha hear these voices talking to you or you're talking to yourself. And oftentimes they're very critical and um, judgmental. And what the technique traditionally teaches you is to not to be attracted to them or attached to them and just let them flow by. The difference uh, in this particular case with what she taught me was that there was, of course, the relaxation and breathing part, the body survey to relax your muscles. Because what many people who are stressed and anxious or from backgrounds like mine, because essentially there's nothing in their life that is predictable. And as a result, their sympathetic nervous system is chronically engaged. And uh, they're always looking around, waiting for something to happen because that is how their life is. It's chaotic versus a normal child's life or normal family life is generally predictable. You know what your parents will be doing, you know, when you're going to eat, uh, et cetera. And uh, so the first thing she taught me was to realize how tight my muscles were and how I really had a hard time focusing. and unless you're able to focus and be present, it's very difficult to um, succeed and attend and to learn. So the first uh, thing she did was to um, teach me that. And, uh, uh, and then once I had mastered that and was able to be present with her, the next thing that she taught me was a, um, a technique which we would now call self-compassion. Uh, there's a woman by the name of uh, um, Kristen Neff, who actually is a researcher who's popularized this concept of self-compassion, whereby instead of being critical to ourselves, instead of being judgmental, which many of us are, uh, she teaches these techniques to give yourself uh, affirmation, to be kind to yourself, and to tell yourself that you're worthy of love, that uh, you can uh, do uh, different things, you can accomplish, uh, and frankly, you can do anything you want to do. Because what happens for so many people is that they tell themselves out of their own fear and anxiety that they're not good enough, they're not smart enough to do things. And what I tell people is, in some ways, that's like building a prison for yourself brick by brick by each of these negative thoughts. And when you say, I cannot, uh, then that becomes your reality. So she taught me not to just let it pass by. She taught me how to change the dialogue that was going on into my head to one of uh, kindness, compassion, and uh, the other thing about that is that when you're critical to yourself, uh, you have a tendency to look through uh, the lens uh, of being critical with everything or about everything uh, around you. You're critical of other people. Uh, you're critical of circumstances. Uh, 
And once you become self-compassionate, you're much more thoughtful and kind. And one of the reasons that is, is because when your sympathetic nervous system is engaged, this is a survival mechanism and it shuts out a lot of information. And uh, you're just trying to get to the next point uh, versus when you are able to do this breathing exercise and relax and shift from this fear modality, uh, this results actually in engagement of what we call your executive control areas. And this is where you're able to make decisions which are much more thoughtful and discerning because you have all of the information that allows you to make a thoughtful decision. And it's interesting, uh, although people quote Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's uh, Search for Meaning, uh, he used uh, a statement, although the quote is not uh, found in any of his books, but it's he's been uh, the person who's been quoted who said this. But basically, he said that uh, between stimulus and response lies your freedom. And what I mean by that is that most of us, especially when we're anxious and afraid, we make an immediate decision about something. Oftentimes, it's not the best decision. If you're able to have a pause between stimulus and response, then you're much more likely to make a more thoughtful and discerning decision. And in fact, the statement is that within that pause lies your freedom. And what he means by that is that when you're in a reactive mode, uh, you're not uh, at your best by any means, and you're just trying to survive, versus when you think things through and you're able to see the world much more clearly, many of the circumstances that have triggered you actually uh, many times have nothing to the, uh, in regard to the person we are talking to. Many people. Uh, have a response to stresses, uh, and then that clouds every decision they make. So if they meet someone, then they can get in an argument with them. And it may be because they had an argument earlier with somebody else, or they actually ate food that they didn't like, or they woke up on the wrong side of the bed. But we have a tendency to feel that when somebody is negative towards us, then we have to react to them. And uh, if you're much more kind and gentle and thoughtful, uh, you will realize, though, that the actions of others often have nothing to do with you. Uh, as an example, to show you how changing your perception can happen so quickly, uh, if you, and I'm sure this has happened to everyone on uh, this call, is you've been cut off while you're getting on the freeway or something. Somebody has taken their car and cut in front of you and, and you've almost had an accident. Well, your immediate response to that is usually uh, some expletive or some um, uh, terminology that may not be so nice to the other person, or you may use a hand gesture. Uh, and and you're just reacting to that because you're angry. You feel they've taken advantage of you. They're trying to get ahead of you. But if I ch told you that the person driving that car, his wife's in the car uh, with him. She's nine months pregnant. Uh, her water has broken. She's bleeding. And he's trying to get her to the hospital. Then your whole perception changes. You want to help him. You understand why he uh, was doing what he was, uh, was doing. And yet, it's the same situation. It's how you have uh, perceived it and how you've responded to it. And this is really the power of compassion and looking at the, th the world through compassionate eyes. Another example, it's raining outside and two people come out of the office building dressed exactly the same same age. One person walks out and he says, 
wow, you know, we so need this rain. There's been a drought. It's water that nurtures the earth. Uh, I want to feel the rain on my face. It makes me feel good. Wow, what a joy. Uh, this is amazing. You have another person walk out and he says, this is horrible. My whole day is ruined. I'm going to be late for my appointment. Why did it have to rain? It ruined my day. And again, you have two people experiencing the exact same event, yet for one, it's a very positive response, and for the other, it's a very negative response. And what's the difference? The difference is here. You are the determinant of how you see the world. And it is within us to change our perception of the world. And these techniques, the compassionate cultivation training program and other techniques like that, give us the tools to change how we see the world. Many people look outside themselves to make them happy. But the reality is the only thing that can make you happy is within you. Yes, what a great subject, Jean. I am really, really happy to have you here with my, our audience in Mexico. I personally have learned the cultivation of compassion under the guidance of one of the best practitioners, such as Dr. Jimpa, former interpreter for the Dalai Lama, along with Robert Cusit, and with you, for sure. Learning the, connect, the connection between the brain and the heart, no? beyond, beyond the physical. I love your alphabet of the heart, 10 letters uh, to live by, compassion, dignity, equanimity, equanimity, forgiveness, gratitude, humility, integrity, justice, kindness, and love. How do you suggest people could put this into practice in their daily lives, Jim? Really is that each and every one of us is going to have stressful times in the day. And uh, the alphabet of the heart, uh, I think, can be uh, very, very helpful. That was created when I was asked to speak to the incoming medical students at my university. And I wanted to give them something that was easy to remember and that would not only make them a better doctor, but a better human being. And I came up with those uh, 10 letters. And uh, people ask me, what is your personal practice? Uh, and what I do every morning is I sit up on the side of the bed and I do a breathing exercise. And again, what that does, simply the breathing part shifts you into engagement of your parasympathetic nervous system and calms you down. And then I think about the joy and awe of being in this world. And then I go through each letter, uh, compassion for self and others, recognizing the dignity of every person, uh, practicing equanimity, this evenness of temperament where you don't get lost on the extremes because the reality is uh, it's transitory. And some people get lost in this attachment to always being up and being acknowledged and receiving things and being told how smart they are. And the reality is when you crave that, you want more of it, but it's not going to ever last. And you have to come back down. And the other side is that you go and have a dip and you're having a bad time, you're having a difficult time and you're, you're being challenged by it. But again, these are transitory. And the interesting thing though, is if you think about the most challenging and difficult lessons you've learned in your life, they don't come from up here. They invariably come uh, from when you've been having challenging times. That's when you learn who you are. That's where you learn resilience. It actually teaches you, in fact, how much strength you have really deep inside of you. Uh, and so it's an incredible uh, concept not to get lost at these extremes, but to take every day as best you can 
with the same attitude. And then forgiveness. Uh, for many people, they will hold this anger inside of them towards another person. And unfortunately, every time they think of that person or that event, it creates uh, negative emotions for them. And what I tell people is that an event or an interaction with somebody is essentially a black and white picture. But when we put it into our memory, we paint the picture with our emotions. And that is what we put into our memory. And that every time we think of it, it's the emotion uh, that comes up and that has a very negative uh, consequence. And so when you realize you are the determinant of how you feel about an event, as we talked a little bit earlier, you can change how you put that event in and understand an event and interaction doesn't have a positive or a negative, it is simply an event. And it is each of us who chooses how we respond to that event. If you can do that in your interactions, then these things won't set you off. But the other aspect is that when you are angry at someone, you know, people somehow think that being angry is going to affect the other person and it has no impact on the other person whatsoever. And in fact, it's like drinking poison and then thinking it's going to help uh, or change the other person or have an effect on them and it only hurts yourself. And then you, of course, we have gratitude. You know, for most of us, if we are even on this call, we are better off than a large, large percentage of people in the world. Remember, over 50% of the world's population live on less than $2.50 a day. And uh, if you have an education, if you have a job, if your arms and legs work, if you're able to talk, you're better off than a large uh, percentage of people in this world. And while it may not be your ideal situation that you're in at that moment, there is always uh, the possibility to make the world a better place and you to be better simply by having the right attitude. What I tell people is that when I finished this period of time with Ruth, my personal situation had not changed whatsoever. But what I did understand was and was grateful for was that interaction with Ruth and also because I changed how I looked at the world. And I tell people that when you change how you interact with the world, the world changes how it interacts with you. And that's been my experience. If you're, you know, humans have this incredible ability to look at someone and get a sense of their emotional state. And if you carry anger and hostility all the time, uh, people interpret that and either they want to stay away from you or they don't find it pleasant to be around you. So when I changed to have a much more open, forgiving, thoughtful personality and interaction with the world, this is how the world treated me. The other thing was I used to have a lot of hostility and anger towards my parents. But what I learned is that their own problems, my father's alcoholism, my mother's depression, they occurred because they did not have the tools to care for themselves. And they were not angry at me or being mean to me. They just did not have the tools to care for themselves and they were suffering. And so my anger dissipated uh, in that interaction. Humility, uh, you know, it's often common for people who've achieved certain things, gotten a degree, have a prominent position, have money, to feel they're important. And uh, unfortunately, this feel, sense of feeling important, uh, it's actually an indication of your own insecurity. Um, and as a result, 
obviously, it doesn't help people who want to interact with you, but it doesn't help you function in the world. Yes, it's true that oftentimes prominent people, wealthy people, um, can get away with a lot. But the reality is, for most of us, we have to interact with people in the world because we need other people for our survival and to help us. And in terms of, as an example, me being a doctor, you know, people can tell what type and how good of a doctor you are by how you walk down the hallway. And what I mean by that is a good doctor, a humble doctor, recognizes that every person in the healthcare team is important. And that means the person who's emptying the bedpans, that means the person who's changing the sheets, that means the nurses, uh, everyone. And without them, I cannot do my job. You know, so many people accomplish uh, things and it's all I, 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 I. But the fact of the matter is none of us accomplish anything on our own. We are part of an organism, if you will, that by working together, we make the world a better place. And when we recognize each of us is important, uh, things go much better. Uh, I is for integrity or having values that you live by. This bounds us and, and, uh, as to what we feel uh, defines us. Are we kind? Are we compassionate? Do we care for other people? And then, of course, uh, K is for kindness. Just simply being a good person to another for no other reason. You don't expect anything. They're not necessarily suffering. You're just nice. And, of course, all of this is contained by the word love. And that's the choice in some ways. It's the narrative of fear in which your sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated, or it's turning towards love, which is essentially when your parasympathetic nervous system get, gets engaged, you're open, you're more caring, you're more thoughtful. That's your choice. And that choice lies within you to change which direction you turn. This is a treasure. You are a treasure, Jim, by the way. <laughs> As you know, Jim, I am professor of, um, um, of private international law, and I teach in alternative dispute resolution, and um, very specifically mediation, international, international family mediation. And I cannot help but connect compassion with uh, mediation and meditation too. By the way, I am not confusing terms here, just to be clear. <laughs> As a mediator, it is uh, crucial to learn and to use different techniques, skills, life skills in our mediations. I am talking about promoting a culture of peace, the culture of agreement, to be an active uh, listener, genuine, authentic listeners. We need to be creative and never judgmental, flexible, patient, take a breath when we have an impasse, etc. Uh, uh, definitely we need um, a wider set of skills that demands uh, the cultivation, cultivation of an emerging and to some extent new field in mediation, which is the cultivation of compassion, especially in societies as individualistic as the ones we live in today. We need to relax our minds and med meditation plays a fundamental role here. Then why it is important to talk about compassion and more specifically, how do you think compassion could benefit professionals in the mediation and related fields? Well, I think it's frankly absolutely critical. I mean, first of all, you have you know two groups who are polarized, if not more than two, and each of them has made judgments about the other. And I think one of the most important things is treating each party with dignity and recognizing that they have a 
point of view uh, and not criticizing them for having that point of view. And obviously, uh, uh, this is very, very important if you're actually simply being compassionate. Uh, I meet people who disagree with me uh, about different things. And the first thing I try to do is not to um, uh, denigrate them or uh, imply that they're somehow inferior. Uh, it's critically important uh, that one, be, one is non-judgmental. Uh, you know, I see people, uh, not directly as a neurosurgeon, but who may have associated uh, problems such as uh, drug or alcohol abuse uh, or other issues uh, that uh, I don't dis or don't necessarily agree with, but my job is to help them, not to judge them. And I think that's really how you have to look at this. You know, you mentioned active listening, and the reality is that um, through important aspects, everyone has a story and they want their story heard. And if you do not give people the ability to tell their story, to ventilate uh, how they ended up in that particular position, then of course that makes them feel not listened to and angry. You know, I've even had people make appointments to see me who don't even have neurosurgical problems. And the reason they want to see me is for me to listen to their story. And uh, so I listen, I lean forward, I look at them, and I just let them talk, and I encourage them to talk. And at some point, they stop talking. And uh, you acknowledge it, you tell them that it wasn't their fault, that they did the best they could under the circumstance, that you could understand how they made those decisions. And, uh, and frankly, uh, they almost um, always start crying. And you simply hold them and hug them. And this is because so many people especially angry people, feel that no one has taken the time to listen to them. And that, I think, is a very, very uh, important aspect of mediation. Uh, you have to be uh, an unbiased party who is there to hear them out, who uh, respects them, who doesn't judge them. And the nature of not being judged uh, creates an environment of what we call psychological safety. Because when people are judged, they again go into this fear mode. Uh, it short circuits their executive control function areas. They cannot think beyond surviving. And of course, then it limits their ability to make thoughtful judgments on how to move forward to resolve a conflict. And it's one's job as a mediator to understand this scenario and take all of these aspects that I just mentioned, which when you have been trained in compassion, you've cultivated compassion for yourself, you've cultivated compassion for others, it makes the job of a mediator, I believe, uh, much easier. Yes, absolutely. And from my perspective, uh, I needed to learn more tools than those available through mediation training and practice. Educating mediators in awareness and congruence is a fundamental part of mediation training. When we teach compassion in a mediation program, we teach that a smile is contagious, that being kind is contagious, being grateful is contagious, being generous is continuous, uh, praise is contagious for sure. We are talking about the permission to be human, that is the ability to allow ourselves to feel and express a variety, variety of emotions uh, freely. Uh, compassion uh, encourages, expresses a series of, of assert, assertions uh, when we say that, as you said, earlier, 
happiness does not come from the outside. Happiness must be sought within ourselves. When we nurture ourselves inside, we are rewarded. When you care about others, you are rewarded. And when 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 we uh, um, we will be motivated uh, to be careful with and to take care of others because it has been scientifically proven that when you cultivate compassion towards others, you display gratitude by you said during this evening. Uh, Jean Doty maintains from neuroscience as a neurosurgeon, and correct me if I am wrong, Jean, that gratitude has positive um, uh, physio physiological effects to the point that uh, your lifespan can be extended. We are taking, we are talking about uh, being grateful to the universe, to life, to feeling grateful for what you have. It is important to exercise not only to look good externally, let's exercise our brain like a muscle, practice meditation through mindfulness, compassion cultivation training, you know, internal conversation is very important, authentic, not fine. Congress, con Congress between words and deeds. Uh, because don't forget that values such as integrity are passed on to our children. And what does all this have to do with meditation? Mediation, sorry. Well, everything. These are precisely tools, skills for mediation. My proposal, proposal is that we can change cliches and add new mediation skills. For example, I have a problem and I delegate it to a lawyer. What if in, instead I use medita mediation and I assume my responsib responsib responsibility and in addition to the aforementioned uh, traditional mediation skills, I also learned and promote uh, compassion. Remember, and you said, that we are part of a society, that we are links in this uh, society, uh, that these links are interconnected and what affects one directly or indirectly affects others. We must assume our responsibility and create spaces for agreement, for peace that results without a doubt in our own personal peace. Being able to connect to, to the human side of people should not prevent you, prevent you from doing your job. Jim, uh, how do you do this in your everyday practice and how would you suggest to do this in other professions such as mediation? Well, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, my own practice really uh, uh, takes only about 15 or 20 minutes a day. Uh, the other interesting thing is that um, one of the actual tools that I use um, was developed actually by someone who read my book. And uh, I don't know if I showed this to you. Let me see if I can find this. Actually, I realize it's in my pocket. So you see this? Yeah. So uh, one of the, uh, a woman who read my book, who is the head of the uh, uh, spiritual director of the largest homeless shelter in the United States, read the book and then uh, was very moved. She uh, called me and uh, what she did was she actually made uh, that set of beads, or I shouldn't say she did, she was telling her best friend and her daughter was there who was nine and her daughter makes beads and on her own, uh, she made a set of 10 beads, wooden beads with a gold bead, the gold bead to represent the golden rule. And uh, then she actually made a video, which you can find on YouTube called Compassion Bead San Antonio. But the reason I tell you that story is that she sells these throughout the world and to a lot of people who've read my book. 
and uh, and the money actually goes to the homeless shelter. But the reason I show this is because I carry these in my pocket all the time. And so in addition to my practice in the morning, if I'm particularly stressed or anxious or something's going on, I will hold these and then go through them. And it sort of resets my mind uh, to where it should be, one of calmness and uh, compassion. And it's a very good reminder of, uh, of that. Because oftentimes when we practice mindfulness in the morning, what we oftentimes do is in modern society, we either get in conflict or we feel pressure, and this creates stress and anxiety. And when you feel that, if you can step away, even for just a couple minutes, and either concentrate on one of the letters of the alphabet, uh, if you have some beads, almost anything, and just start your breathing exercise just for a minute or two, that in and of itself will reset your intention. Great, great. Really, really very, very important, you know, tips and advices. Um, I, I was thinking that by being compassive, um, by being compassive, I am thinking about uh, me like a mediator. By being compassive, we don't lose neutrality or impartiality as a mediator. Our motivation is for the mediation to take place in a context of peace. A mediator facilitates communication with the ultimate goal that the parties find peace through the communication process itself or a potential, a potential agreement. The mediator's compassion is expressed, expressed by facilitating that the party's suffering is uh, alleviated. Compassion uh, motivates you to add to alleviate the painful uh, feelings uh, on the other. One motivation as a mediator is to alleviate suffering or at least this should be the starting point for a good mediator. Uh, mediation action uh, should be more effective because there is um, additional motivation for mediators. Empath empathy towards the parties is a key attribute of the mediators. But I believe we should go beyond that. Uh, can you tell us, Jean, um, about the difference between sympathy, uh, empathy, and compassion? Sure. Um, so in some ways, uh, it's almost uh, like a graph going like this. You know, sympathy is um, understanding another's emotional state. Empathy is actually taking on their emotional state. And then compassion is understanding that someone is suffering with a desire to alleviate that suffering. And in some ways, uh, as you go up, the engagement uh, actually between you and the other party increases. Sympathy to me is something that you can recognize in your head that let's say an injustice has been done or something. But beyond that, it doesn't do anything. Empathy is when you can actually look at the aggrieved party and have an appreciation for their perspective and what they have suffered. And of course, compassion is the component of trying to alleviate that suffering. Great, because you know, there are different um, in our field. It's very important to have a uh, well, well, you know, well known how is the, the path for this. Talking about um, the future of mediation, I am aware that maybe before we know it, an, an algorithm will resolve agreements of different kinds, but such an algorithm will only be effective if the human being who will always be behind it, has the skill to, to know, instruct, and repeat inappropriate patterns. Artificial intelligence uh, accompanied by the human factor, the, the so-called hybrid intelligence with inclusive robotization, has an error rate below uh, 0.5%. This is a positive vision of artificial intelligence, and therefore, of what is to come in the 
very near future. Jin, how do you think we can introduce compassion into such uh, automated scenarios? Well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, humans themselves have unconscious biases. And uh, many people uh, don't appreciate that. Uh, and that can relate to interacting with people of other uh, races or cultures. And uh, while the person may insist that they have no bias, in fact, they do. And uh, when you think about these different algorithms, uh, oftentimes, uh, well, in fact, all times, they're divine, uh, developed by uh, individuals. And so uh, artificial intelligence actually can be created that is unfortunately biased. And in fact, if you think about it, most of the engineers who develop these products um, are white and uh, between the ages of 25 to 45, and they have their own inherent biases that they oftentimes will put into this artificial intelligence. So one has to be aware of that. As an example, there's a program that offer or that helps determine prison sentences and who will uh, be recidivistic or who will end up in prison again, and whether they should give this person parole or that person parole. And while they may look at the data, and it may imply that uh, a certain race of uh, people are more likely to end up in prison again, the reality is that if the system and the people who put them in prison are biased and uh, you incorporate these choices, then uh, you're going to have a very biased system. And in fact, you're probably aware of a chatbot that was developed by Microsoft that they put on the internet who was going to learn how to interact. And very quickly, people took advantage and they basically made her a racist to the point where they shut down the program. So you have to be very careful uh, with artificial intelligence and have a clear understanding of what the goals are and uh, the potential biases that can be incorporated into uh, these different uh, products that are, or algorithms that are being developed. That being said, I, I think if it's done correctly, uh, it can be very, very advantageous uh, in a lot of areas. I agree with you, absolutely. And maybe the last uh, question, uh, Jim, uh, per your uh, bio, I believe our audience will be interested in how you got connected with the Dalai Lama. Can you tell us something about that? Sure. So uh, it's interesting. My um, wife is in love with the Dalai Lama. And when we met, to be honest with you, uh, I had no interest in the Dalai Lama whatsoever. And uh, what happened is when I returned to Stanford, I started this uh, Project Compassion, which turned into Seek Care, or the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And we had a group of people that would get together to discuss research projects and uh, develop uh, uh, research projects. And uh, so after one of these meetings, I was walking through campus and suddenly the picture uh, of the Dalai Lama came into my head. And it's interesting because my wife, a few years before, had bought tickets for her and I to go to a Dalai Lama event and I actually refused to go. Uh, so anyway, uh, I was walking around and I could not uh, shake this image from my brain. It just stuck there. And uh, we were planning a scientific conference talking about compassion. And suddenly it came to me uh, that I should invite the Dalai Lama. And as a result, uh, he had spoken at Stanford a few years before. And I tracked down the person who invited him and ultimately got an invitation uh, to meet with him. And this meeting was supposed to last about 15 minutes. And uh, it ended up lasting about an hour and a half. And His Holiness immediately agreed to return to Stanford. 
And um, at the end of our discussion, Thupton Jinpa, who you know, uh, was having an animated conversation with him. And at the end of it, Thupton Jinpa said to me, Jim, his holiness is so moved by this endeavor you're undertaking that he wants to make a donation to your work. And at that moment, he gave me the largest donation he had ever given to a non-Tibetan cause. And this was really the, the first time I had met him. So it was really quite amazing and extraordinary. And as a result, um, two other individuals came forward and made significant donations. And that's how the center was uh, created. And then I became the chairman of the Dalai Lama Foundation later. And he and I became close friends. Great. This is wonderful. Wonderful. Absolutely. Um, I would like to conclude uh, by stating that mediation means satisfaction, uh, well-being, and therefore happiness, and with it, uh, a path of, for forgiveness. Differences between people are inevitable, and therefore it constitutes a social sex that there is reparation, that there are agreements in their conflicts of voluntary submission to to mediation. We are talking about abandoning the culture of confrontation to land of the culture of negotiation, culture of peace, dialogue and, and agreement. For my point of view, uh, mediation in these uh, current times promotes unlearning what has been wrongly learned. We all can learn to live in a different way so that we resolve our difference more through dialogue, each um, one of us being part of the solution, to be able to move on with our lives without that heavy burden that we can hurry not only on our shoulders, but on our emotions that impact our health negatively. This goal implies um, a great challenge, but it is more than necessary. It is urgent and cannot be postponed. This is my conclusion, but I would like to know if you have any final remarks that you would like to, to add. Well, one of the things we did not talk about is that when you practice compassion, uh, <coughs> for many people, uh, one of the results is that your blood pressure is lower, uh, your pulse decreases, your immune system is boosted, the expression of inflammatory proteins, which are associated with a lot of disease states, actually markedly diminishes, your cortisol level and other levels of stress, hormones uh, actually markedly decrease. And as a result, you're actually, by the very nature of being compassionate, you were much healthier. And in fact, more so than being at your ideal body weight or doing exercise. And as you pointed out, it affects your telomere length, which is associated with longevity. So there's so many advantages to being compassionate. And what people don't realize is that as a species, we actually involve, evolved to be caring, compassionate, and nurturing. Because unlike other species where the offspring run off into the forest, our offspring requires us to nurture them for around 15 years before they can function independently. And as a result, we have this mirror neuron system. And when we have our child offspring suffering, why would you take care of them for uh, you know, this long period of time and with the necessary time and uh, expense of that, uh, unless you're rewarded. And the way you're rewarded is that when you care for another, when you're kind, when you're compassionate, you have the release of oxytocin and other hormones that are associated uh, with pleasure and reward. And so when you really care for another person, when you express this, it has a huge positive effect on you, both in terms of your physiology, but also it affects your uh, pleasure and reward centers. 
Jim, please don't stop doing this kind of things. Continue. We need you. You are so important in our life. It's something that I, you know, maybe because I am the honorary president of your fan club. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is so important. And to have you in our life is something wonderful. You can imagine how grateful I am for this. Dear Jean, thank you so much for sharing your precious time with us. For me and for the audience, for sure, this is a very special occasion. Thank you for coming to Mexico through my, yes. uni through my university, the National Autonomous University of Mexico and its Legal Research Institute. Next time, we hope it can be in person. I would love to show. I would love to show you around this wonderful uh, country. Thank you, thank you again for this amazing talk and your generosity, um, because you are a remarkable person. To to our audience, obviously, thank you for listening. Um, for everybody, have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you. It's amazing. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Um, you know, I see you soon. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Take care. Thank you.